So today I'm going to talk about uh, or some recent work on the non-convex uh, concave or non-concave minimax optimization. And uh, for those of you who has been like uh, into my la lecture in San Sanjeev's course last year, uh, no, la last week, uh, actually like the uh, first half of the talk would be roughly similar. And uh, because this is kind of like a reasonably small audience, if you have any question, just please raise your hands and uh, we can go over some more details, okay? And uh, I'm Chi, and uh, I'm in IS this year and uh, this semester. I'm also at Princeton. So first, about the minimax optimization. I guess this uh, framework about minimax optimization is mostly used to deal with uh, those uh, multi-agent decision making type of uh, application in practice. And suppose like uh, we have more than one agent. Like for in this case, we had two agents, and this is like a zero-sum game. Um, both brothers are strive for ice creams. So it's either the big brother get the ice cream and he get the plus one rewards, or the little brother get the ice cream. Okay, so. In practice, uh, how we solve this problem, um, so we usually frame this uh, kind of problem into a minimax optimization. So suppose we have a payoff function, which is a, a function of both x and y. x is kind of like uh, the action first player can play, and y is the action second player can play. And uh, the question we usually want to solve is this uh, min max optimization. So first we solve the mean, uh, we have the mean of over x, max over y, and f x y. Okay. And in this talk, I will be especially interested in the case where f is no longer just convex concave. It can be non-convex uh, when we fix y, and also can be non-concave when we fix x. And I want to just uh, make sure we kind of like, we understand this in the first page. In general. We don't have one uh, min max theorem. That is, min max is not equal to max min. And for those uh, problems, so only in the convex concave setting, this is true. And in the non convex non concave setting, in general, this is not true. So in this talk, I will be especially interested in this min max, and the order actually kind of like matters. So we kind of like know there are a lot of popular applications of this min-max frameworks in machine learning. And the very first famous one is this adversarial training, where we all kind of like know neural networks is not very robust in the sense uh, for some neural networks, they kind of classify this picture as a pick, and we're just adding some very small random noise, uh, or some adversarial noise. And it actually can just uh, classify this uh, same, almost same picture where human will say there's no difference, but the neural network will say this is actually an error line. So in this uh, type of uh, um, like community, people kind of trying to deal with this problem by like frame this as a two-player games, where we have the first player as a robust classifier, we want to train a very robust classifier, and the second player want to add in some adversarial noise. So we kind of like hoping when they compete with each other and eventually the robust classifier kind of like learn something really robust and they're robust to this adversarial noise. And the second type people also know a lot is this uh, GAN, generative adversarial networks, and we have both, uh, the task is really we just want to generate some picture which is, uh, looks very similar to the, to the real images. And so the two player here is like we have generator, we have discriminator, where generator, trying to generate some image which, uh, which is look like the real image, but the screener trying to tell which one is generated or which one is the true image. So we kind of hoping when they compete against each other, eventually generator will learn to generate better and better images, okay? So um, for, the, this, uh, uh, for this minimax optimization, there are actually a very basic algorithm which is similar to gradient descent in the minimi minim minimization community. This is called gradient descent ascent. So basically, because we have two agents, one trying to minimize, the other agent trying to maximize, we can just think of a very basic algorithm where x is the minimizer, the, uh, the main player, he would just do the gradient descent, while the y is the max player, he's just trying to do gradient ascent. And uh, this algorithm, although very simple, actually in a convex concave case, it's actually provably correct. So we can look at this picture. This is a more or less a, a very typical convex concave geometry, where x is just doing gradient descent and eventually finding the right one, and y is just doing gradient ascent and eventually finding the right one. And we can actually, so the classical literature proof uh, with com for any convex concave functions, gradient descent ascend with averaging. So they need averaging over all the previous iterates, eventually going to find optimal. In this case, for convex concave, optimization problems is just a Nash equilibrium and very efficiently with some convergence rates, okay? 
But uh, I also want to point out, although this picture looks like it's just uh, similar to, very similar to minimization and some results just kind of carry over, but it actually has a lot of unique phenomena in this uh, minimax optimization, which is not happening in the minimization problem at all. So the first one is so-called limit cycle. And we can just look at a very simple example where fxy is a, like x and y are both one-dimensional um, one-dimensional variables, and this is just a, like a, like scalar fun functions x times y, and we can compute the gradient. Um, this uh, gradient descent ascent follow the vector flow, which is minus one and x. And if we just uh, plot out this GDA flow, and we realize it's just uh, completely a cycle. It's uh, Although the Nash equilibrium is actually here, but nothing will converge to this Nash equilibrium. Everything is just circling around. Okay, and we note that this is not any non-convex non-curve. This is just actually a bilinear function. So this is a convex concave problem. So this limit cycle even exists in the convex concave setting. And in general, we will realize uh, just because uh, we are no longer doing gradient flow, and this is some general like dynamics, and once the Jacobian matrix is uh, asymmetric, we always possible to incur those like limit cycle. So gradient descent is really special because we are following the gradient flow, and the Jacobian matrix in our case is Hessian matrix, which is symmetric. So there has been a lot of work designed to deal with this limit cycle problem. So we kind of like we we probably heard a lot of like optimistic GDA, and we want to do the last iterate convergence instead of doing averaging. So those results are actually purely focused on so the, the results theoretical results we know are purely focused on the convex concave setting. As we said, the classical work with gradient descent ascent or actual gradient is actually requiring averaging. So they are not guaranteed to have last iterate convergence. They are guaranteed to have when you average you kind of converge. Well, some recent work, a lot of algorithm was designed so that I guarantee I have some last iterate convergence coming to the Nash equilibrium. However, when we go to non-convex, like concave or non-convex, non-concave scenario, those limit cycle structure were dramatically different. So, so, so far I would say like, I don't know any of the results gonna generally extend to those non-convex setting. I would say in a non-convex setting, this limit cycle in general is kind of hard and nobody really knows how to deal with it even till today. And the second one, also the very important thing is about the progress tracking. So we all know like when we do minimization problem, for example, we do a stochastic gradient descent and we can have some function to track, which is like just a function value of my current iterates. And we're gonna say that this function value is gonna monetarily decrease. And uh, in the non-convex concave, in the general, in the minimax optimization, it's kind of like very hard because uh, one guy wants to move up and the other guy wants to move down. So we don't have any monotonic decreasing. But uh, in a special case of convex concave minimax optimization, we have something very special because uh, we know we have this monoid by minimax theorem. So the minimax is equal to maximum. So we can thought of look at some, something like a duality gap. Like uh, if, if I'm in current xt and if I'm max y and uh, minus if I'm current yt and mean x. And we can prove this one is greater than Nash equilibrium and this one is always smaller than Nash equilibrium. This is really just a duality gap saying like how far you are away like from this Nash equilibrium. However, we know this structure is uh, very special to the convex concave setting. In the non-convex uh, minimax optimization, nothing is known about taking, making track of um, those kind of things. It's actually a real problem, even training again. And, it was, and like, uh, in training again, like, we don't really know, are we improving or are we actually getting worse? So this talk, I will, I will focus on like two scenarios. So because this is like general about non-convex like non minimax optimization, I will first talk about a simple case where I want to generalize like convex concave to one side non-convex, the other side is non the other side is concave, and then later we will talk about both sides are non-convex and concave. Okay. So we note, um, this is, uh, although this is different from convex concave setting, but this has uh, one very big advantage, just because uh, the maximization problem is a concave, so we know actually this inner max can be solved efficiently by any algorithm like gradient ascent, accelerated gradient ascent, or whatever it is. And we will note this maximization function value as a phi x. Okay. So one very basic algorithm you can think of is really just uh, I solve till approximate max, and then why not I do something similar to gradient descent. So this is an algorithm we call a gradient with max oracle. That is essentially, for any fixed uh, xt is my current iterate, I try to find a yt so that it's almost uh, the max of uh, current xt up to some zeta arrow. It's approximately max. 
And then I just took gradient descent upon this uh, partial gradient of x on x t and y t, my current choice. And we know this algorithm actually applies to more general problem, not only the just concave problem, it can also be applied to any problem where the maximization can be solved efficiently. Or you can like give me some oracle, I can solve this maximization problem for you. Okay. So what we can say about this uh, GD max algorithm in solving this minimax optimization? It turns out our recent results kind of like saying we don't need much and we actually have very good results. As long as function f is L smooth, which is like gradient Lipschitz, and the function itself is Lipschitz. And then I do this gradient design with max oracle, we'll visit so-called epsilon stationary point of this max function, where max is uh, like a pointwise I taking max over y, this phi function, in this number of iterations. Um, for those familiar with uh, the new uh, optimization, this delta phi is essentially just a difference between your initial value on this max phi and also the optimal value. And L, L squared is the Lipschitz parameter, and it, most importantly, the iteration is scaled with uh, epsilon to the minus four. Okay. So what it really says, this result is kind of like saying, okay, although minimax optimization in general is difficult, but as long as we can solve max globally, this minimax optimization is actually not hard at all. So we already have some results. We're able to find this stationary point as similar to non-max optimization. So I want to go into a little bit about details of why this is happening. So very naive idea people would think is, uh, as I said, I'm just uh, more or less just uh, max, trying to find the max function phi and doing something similar to gradient descent. It's essentially just uh, similar to a minimax, um, minimization problem and where I kind of like know for minimization problem, I do gradient descent, I always find a situation point. The answer is partially yes, but actually it's more tricky than that one. Because we want to know actually this uh, phi function, the maximization function, in most non-trivial case, is always non-smooth. So that's why we have to deal with non-smooth in this phi function. Just a very simple example, I look at this convex concave problem where x times y, and I want to max over y, which is in the interval of minus one and one. This gives me a max function of phi, and in case this function is just absolute value of x, and this is just con this is non-smooth. And uh, the problem is actually pretty large, uh, pretty big, because in general, non-smooth, non-convex optimization is extremely hard. Okay. I would say the non-smooth function, not like smooth non-convex function, can be something ridiculous, where they can like be self-similar and they can like in, they can like uh, all this uh, like non-smooth point can actually infinitely close to each other. So basically, even if you just run subgradient or whatever the gradient is set on it, and you don't really know what kind of guarantee you have in general. I, yes. Oh, non-smooth means uh, the the gradient is not lilliptious. So basically, when you change the point very, uh, the, the two very close point, the gradient can be very different. Well, in a smooth function, if the two points are very close, the gradient is very similar. Right, but you don't mean infinitely different. No, no, no. Yeah, it's just uh, it's non non smooth. It's really just non non gradient lipschitz. Okay. So in addition to those kind of very crazy problem, we actually even have problem of defining subgradient. Because uh, for those of you familiar with subgradient, it's usually for convex function, which is just saying your gradient will lower, linear expansion will lower bound the function. But for the non-smooth function, actually we also have some corner which is pointing upwards, and where you just have no gradient will lower bound in your function. So you might want to define some super gradient or something which is uh, kind of like, uh, pretty difficult and in this scenario. And the second thing is uh, we also want to talk about epsilon stationary point. And for smooth function, it's not a problem because uh, for a stationary point and the neighbor, epsilon neighborhood is always an epsilon stationary point. However, for non-smooth function, it's possible like this. There is only one point that is stationary and everything else has like a subgradient, which is at least like a positive one minus one, some constant. So this epsilon stationary point could actually be measure zero. So how could we find a measure zero point, uh, set, which is uh, almost impossible? So this kind of like saying we have to discover some new structure about this uh, maximization phi, so that I cannot say just it's uh, some general non-smooth function. I need to say some, it has some more structure so that I can optimize it efficiently. It turns out uh, our work, and along with a lot of concurrent work, actually identified this max function 
is always going to be L weakly convex. As long as my function f is L smooth, then this function is always going to be weakly convex. So what weakly convex mean is uh, my function adding this uh, L over 2 quadratic term is always going to be convex. So this name is a little bit confusing. Although it's called weakly convex, it's actually very not non-convex. So, okay. It's just uh, more than saying I'm adding some very large Hessian, and uh, I can make it to be la large positive Hessian, and I can make it to be convex. So intuitively, what this kind of structure tells you is, uh, as we said, in a non-smooth function, we might have a corner pointing towards downside. Uh, also, we have some corner pointing towards upside. This is like absolute value function. This is a minus absolute value function. And this weakly convex function is more the same when we add in some positive hashing, and we will make it convex. So in this case, um, this is always true, because this is already convex. And we add in some positive thing, it's also convex. However, for this case, you can actually prove no, no matter how large L you're actually adding it, you cannot make it convex. So intuitively, I would say, if you look at the eigenvalue of hashing, this is more than saying your eigenvalue of hash need to be the, in the minus L to the infinity. So it can be, go crazy like this uh, when you can like, change, uh, change upside, but it cannot go crazy like that when you change the gradient to be downside. Okay. And uh, also, because this weakly convex structure, actually now we're able to define a subgradient. The, the way to define it is also very simple. Because this is convex function, we can def define a subgradient or subdifferential. And because this is smooth function, I can always compute the gradient here. I just uh, take the difference, and which give me a definition of the subgradient into this weakly convex function. And the structure two is uh, because remember we are following actually the partial gradient of x and um, this uh, almost optimal points on y, and it and can actually be proved if it's really the maximizer. It can be any maximizer, but as, as long as it's one of the maximizer then this partial gradient will always inside this sub-differential of uh, my current function. So what these two structures are really saying is uh, when we do this gradient GD max op um, algorithm on minimax optimization, it's uh, really just doing sub-gradient descent. It's almost close to doing sub-gradient descent on this weakly convex function. Yes, please. Sorry. What does weakly convex mean? Like, oh, I already said. Oh. It's not weakly convex. So basically, what I'm saying, weakly convex allows some, some corner like this, but not allow an, any corner pointing upwards. So, but I, do you have an example of a function that's not convex, but is weakly Uh I think you can, you can just uh, make this one like, like the, this. It's also non convex. Minus x squared. Yeah. A lot of, uh, like, I'm saying like you can you can just make some function like this. This is weakly convex, but clearly not non-convex. What I'm saying is just you cannot have any corner pointing upwards, but but you can be anything outside that region. Is this clear? Okay. So now we're saying we just want to do subgradient is an unweakly convex function. And then the next question is uh, how we define this epsilon stationary point. As we said, it's possibly have measure zero, and the optimization algorithm will never find anything with measure zero. So we're very na one naive way we kind of like want to extend this definition is I want to say my epsilon, although this, this is only stationary point here, I want to say as long as I'm close to this stationary point, I'm OK. Because if you think of uh, convex, convex non-smooth optimization, you're kind of like oscillating between this point. What you're really converging to is also something kind of like epsilon close to the, to the optimal point. So basically, this is also a standard definition. We kind of like extend this epsilon stationary point definition to be something so that if I say x is an epsilon stationary point, I have to say there is, exists a point in the nearby where the distance is at most something other epsilon, so that this uh, x tilde point is actually a stationary point. In a sense, I have a subgradient inside my subdifferential set. The norm of the subgradient is smaller than epsilon. Okay. So basically, combine everything. Uh, it turns out uh, there is a very elegant mathematical framework in this weakly convex community to solve this problem. It's called uh, they just deal with this called a uh, moral envelope. Moral envelope essentially, I have a weakly convex function, and I can define it in some like a proximal term and define this uh, phi function. This is called a more envelope of my, this psi is called a more envelope of my phi. And the more envelope has a very, a lot of very good property. 
As long as my phi function is weakly convex, it's not smooth, but my psi is always guaranteed to be a smooth function. And uh, I define this epsilon stationary point in a little bit weird way for this uh, phi function. It turns out it's equivalent to define it in terms of uh, this moral envelope, just the gradient of moral envelope is smaller than epsilon. And most importantly, when we do subgradient descent on this, uh, on this uh, weakly convex function, we can actually prove the moral envelope is actually monotonically decreasing. So every fact of this can like, make this optimization very similar to a smooth optimization once we consider this moral envelope type of thing. And this gives us a very good guarantee to achieve everything like about the GD max and which, why, why we are saying like, as long as we can solve the max efficiently and then everything min max is, uh, is kind of easy. Okay. So, so far we're talking about a GD max algorithm, but people kind of like saying, okay, GD max might be a double loop algorithm where in the inner loop I was trying to do the maximization while out loop I was trying to do gradient descent. How about uh, I just want to do a single loop algorithm like a GDA, like gradient descent ascent, which is like kind of like a little bit cleaner and, uh, and like a, it's easier to implement. And it turns out, yes, uh, we actually can prove something similar for GDA as well. And uh, note, so, so now we actually need exactly need a non-convex non concave function. We cannot just say I have some max oracle because we, can, like, we need to say the, the max problem has to be solved, can be solved by gradient ascent. So then in this case, under my conditions, uh, I can prove uh, GDA actually finds the epsilon stationary point of this max function efficiently. Yes, please. So how big is the rest of LB so that it's... Uh, uh, how, how big is what? Oh, this L is just a smooth, smooth smoothness. Uh, which one? Uh, yeah. This one. This one just smoothness. The, 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 no, I'm saying no. Uh, so kind of like this work is kind of like assuming I know the smoothness parameter of the function. So once you know the smoothness parameter, you're just adding out. In practice, yeah, it's kind of like a, another question to estimating how smooth is our function. And if your function is not very smooth, then this L could be very large. That's the smoothness parameter in both x and y? In both x and y, yeah. So for function f, yeah. I thought the envelope was only used for analysis. Envelope is you only used for analysis, you yeah. Need, you don't need analysis. Uh, no, but, but it potentially... Essentially, the, 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 no, the, the rate is going to show, show up. So yeah. The algorithm, you don't need it. But maybe the learning rate. Learning rate, you need to depend on the L, yeah. Learning rate depends on both the little L and the big L. But both little L and the big L, yes. But your function is not smooth, though. I mean, function itself is non smooth. It's non, uh, function itself is smooth, but when, when we do the ma maximization, it becomes non smooth. Yeah. And I want to argue, like, in general, you cannot avoid this non smoothness for the maximization function. Okay, so yeah, and uh, this is uh, for gradient descent ascent. I will also do the same thing, and in the paper, we will have a lot of settings, uh, like which is non convex uh, strolling concave, non convex concave, and also the stochastic setting. And we kind of work out different rates for different settings. And if you're interested, please look at the paper. And uh, the really trick is uh, we kind of like uh, the key inside is. Uh, so basically, this GD max is uh, I, I kind of like I doing one step of gradient ascent while I doing a lot of step of gradient ascent and trying to approximately ma maximize a function where if effectively I can think of GDA very similar while if I kind of like make the learning rate, rate ratio to be to be the same thing as uh, like how many steps you do gradient ascent over gradient descent. Okay, and then it's really just a technical prop question like uh, I'm no longer just maximizing some function but I'm maximizing some slowly changing function, will, which will induce some error, but uh, like our work kind of like says, we can deal with this kind of error efficiently. Yeah. So sorry, you, you uh, look at, are you analyzing one step GD, M step GA, or one, one? I'm, 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 I'm kind of like analyzing the one, one using, using this kind of like similarity, because the one, one and making the learning rate ratio to be something M, which is kind of like similar to this one step GD and M step GA. This is what I'm arguing. Property of the sort of effective moral envelope after m step, some some finite number of steps instead of going all the way. No, in, in the field there is no no notion like that. Yeah, and the moral envelope is designed purely for the non-smooth function. It's not for the min min max thing. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
So basically, this concludes the first part of my talk. And essentially, I just want to summarize. And so basically, we think minimax optimization in general is pretty challenging. But there is one scenario we actually kind of make it easy. That is if the maximization can be solved efficiently in any manner. Then basically, this minimax optimization can be almost equivalent to the minimization of a weakly, com weakly convex function, it's just a non-smooth minimization problem, which is I kind of like transform this, reduce a minimax problem to a minimization problem, purely minimization problem. However, of course, not always uh, all the problem can, can be, the, the maximization part can be solved efficiently. So let's go with uh, this non-convex, non-concave scenario, where the problem actually become much challenging because we're no longer able to f find this uh, max problem in general. And uh, so it's not very clear how we can reduce a minimax problem to a minimization of any sort of problem. And so that's why we are no longer kind of like uh, saying I want to find station of, of phi or something like that. I would just want to find some local notion which directly from this f. Okay. One very direct problem people are kind of like asking is uh, why not let's just directly find a stationary point of this f. It can be a difficult problem. It can also be a tricky problem. Tricky problem in a sense uh, can be a trivial problem. Trivial problem in a sense if function f is lower bounded. Then one very trivial solution is uh, why not I just forget about this is a minimax problem. I just think it's, this is a minimization. And this is mean over x and y. And I, I can just run gradient descent on this both x and y. If f is lower bounded, by sm and I know f is a smooth function, by just smooth optimization and the classical results in non-convex optimization, I kind of know this guarantees me to find epsilon stationary point of this uh, function f efficiently. However, I know this point is definitely meaningless because I actually doing the minimization instead of doing the min max. So it has absolutely has nothing to do with my problem. So this kind of goes to another question is uh, like in the minima minimization problem, we're not only interested in the stationary point, we also want to find a one order higher. We want to find local minimum instead of just stationary point. We kind of I want to escape the settle points. So this kind of raises a question in the minimax optimization scenario. What is the local optimal or optimality notion in this scenario? Like in addition to the stationary point, what's the second order like notion of local optimality? So essentially, all the previous work, in fact, are looking at this notion, so-called local Nash equilibrium. It's motivated by the convex concave scenario where the optimal point is guaranteed to be low, to be Nash equilibrium. So in a non-confidence, non-concave setting, why not we just look at a local Nash? What local Nash is saying is uh, if x star and y star is a local Nash point, I can first fix x star, and this gives me a function over y. And I'm saying y star needs to be a local max over, over this, this uh, like a slice function. And on the other hand, x star needs to be a local minimum of uh, this uh, y star slice function. Essentially, when we will fix the other player strategy, you don't want to change anything lo 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 locally. Okay. This is the definition of the local Nash equilibrium. It turns out this point may not j exist in general. So in a non-convex, non-concave scenario, not mentioning local Nash, even a global Nash may not exist in general. And uh, we also have a second question. In those applications like GAN or adversarial training, do we actually really want to this local Nash equilibrium? So we can visit, like, in a game theory, there are actually uh, two types of game, because we're doing minimax optimization. So we have two agents. The two agents can play simultaneously, like we want to play this uh, rock, rock, paper, scissor. So both players actually like, play their action simultaneously. You don't see like, the, other action, the other player play before you or something like that. However, the other one is like tic-tac-toe. Like the two player actually play sequentially. We are kind of have a like design order where the order is fixed and one player go first and the other player go second. And we kind of like know Nash equilibrium is actually designed for simultaneous game because um, the the role of both players is actually symmetric and there is no difference in the order like which player go first or second, and so it requires both both players to act simultaneously. However, in a generator as like GANs and adversarial networks, there is a clear sequence of min and max. For example, in the GANs, we always put a generator at first, the minimization, and the max, which is uh, the discriminator on the second. We never do the max mean. And for the adversarial training, it's also the same. We always want to do the robust classifier minimizer on the first, and then maximizer over the noise on the second. So it's really a sequential game, and we actually have a lead, one leader, one follower, 
and this is fixed, and we're never going to change it. So the order is very crucial here, especially because uh, now I'm in the non-convex, non-concave scenario. In general, min max is not equal to max min. So which order it is, it will affect the eventual solution you're going to have. So this kind of like motivates us uh, to look at this uh, for sequential games. What is a uh, global optimality first um, for the sequential games? It turns out it's, uh, it's also like a well-known notion. It's uh, very simple to design. It's just uh, called a minimax point, or we also call it a stackable equilibrium in the game theory, which is essentially saying y star locally need to the max max to be to be response to the x star, which is uh, max is second player. However, x need to prepare for the worst case y. He will think uh, because he play first, he will reveal his action to the min, to the max player y. So he will think whatever he revealed to the y, y will always do the max do the best response, do the maximization for that. He want to minimize not only just fix y star, but I want to do the best response, this phi function, the max function. So what it really saying is the leader always prepare to the for the best follower, for the worst scenario, like if the follower play the best. And the very good point about this global min max is just basically easy, very easy to prove this kind of global optimal points always going to exist under very mild conditions. So then we can we can like make the ask a question: Can we actually design some local notion of these points so that which is uh, developed for the sequential game, which is I'm no longer want to do the local Nash equilibrium? It turns out in our recent work we actually show yes we can do some rigorous mathematical defini definition. It's a little bit tricky, but uh, it's not it's not that difficult. So there are a lot of possibilities, and in our paper we actually eventually prove they are kind of like all almost equivalent. So I will just make a, use a very simple, like a easier, easier to understand notion here, which um, x star y star is a local minimax point. If first is the same thing, other than I just adding a local modifier here, y star is a local max if I fix x star because this is second player is the easier part. However, for the first player, I want to say the the leader will prepare for the best follower, but a follower in a local response. That is, in a sense, if um, the second player will not do the global maximization, but will do a local maximization around the epsilon neighborhood of my y star of the current points. Okay, and because I want to make this uh, definition to be a local property, so this is a epsilon maximization strategy, epsilon local best response. But I want to make this epsilon goes to zero. So I'm gonna say x star is actually a local minimum of this uh, local best response for any small enough epsilon. And this will guarantee this definition is a purely local definition instead of like it depends on anything constant away in the neighborhood. And uh, what this definition gives us is the first proper definition about the local optimality in the sequential games. And uh, there are a lot of bad things can happen in the minimax optimization. One thing is uh, it turns out at this point, unfortunately, may not exist. You might find very surprising why global min max point exists, but local min max point does not exist. So this is a little bit different from minimization problem, where you kind of can always say global minimum is a, is a local minimum. In this setting, actually, it turns out a global min max may not even to be a stationary point. So in that case, global min max need not to be a local min max. So this is a little bit unfortunate. But we have a lot of good property compared to the only local notion we have so far. It's called local Nash equilibrium. First, we can say the local Nash equilibrium is always going to be a local minimax point. So our definition is always strictly a superset of local Nash equilibrium. What it kind of like says, whenever local Nash equilibrium exists, our local minimum points always exist. However, when the local minimum point exists, local Nash is not necessarily, ex uh, not necessarily exists. And uh, in our paper, we also show it has a, a lot of other nicer property compared to local Nash. And I will say, like, a, I will just list a one very important one, which is regarding to some, it's a relation about the limit point of GDA. So first, why we want to care about the limit point of some dynamics, I will just uh, first make analog in the minimization problem. In the minimization problem, I can say, uh, 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 there's a classical results of our previous work, which you kind of like see. When you're adding some noise to gradient descent, it's kind of like doing noisy gradient descent. It actually efficiently going to converge to some so-called local minimum up to some degenerate point. That is, uh, we're actually going to avoid those like a strict saddle points, and we kind of like we will converge to something very similar to a second notion. 
So what's the reason for this is um, because we kind of like, you know if we look at the saddle point around the saddle points, if we follow the gradient flow, and uh, almost always we're going to escape the saddle points. Well, only there's a one line we're going to converge to the saddle point. Once we add in this noise, we kind of like, make it a little bit stable. Then we will always like deviate from this line, and we will always escape the strict saddle points. So in a minimization problem, we actually have a very strong correlation between the simple dynamics and what is the local optimal notion in the, in the minimization problem. So that's motivated us to kind of like want to analyze whether there is some similar relation about the, the, the similar thing in, the, in this minimax problem. Unfortunately, in the beginning, I already said um, for this uh, GDA dynamics in the minimax optimization, or like any dynamics we kind of design, there are always a limit cycle issues where, where we kind of like saying, we kind of like we're stuck in some limit cycle. We don't know how to break it. And it turns out this cycle can even be stable. Like this is an example showed in some previous papers, which kind of like saying no matter where you start, and if you follow the gradient descent ascent dynamics, you eventually convert to this limit cycle. You're always going to convert to the limit cycle. And this cycle is actually stable. If you deviate a little bit from this cycle, you're eventually going to go back to this cycle. So this makes it very challenging to say anything about convergence. But nevertheless, we can still say something about a stable limit point. That is, uh, if I forget about the convergence issue, if I say my GDA is going to converge, if I already guarantee you it converged to some points, then I can discuss whether that point is stable to some perturbation. Okay. So this kind of gives the definition of the stable limit point. That is the limit point, the point I'm going to converge into, and it's also stable to the, to the perturbations. And the previous work, because they studied local Nash equilibrium, they kind of like give these results. They are saying all local Nash equilibrium is inside the stable limit points of GDA. That is good. That means uh, I'm not something like crazy set. However, there are a lot of stable limit points of GDA that is not necessarily local Nash equilibrium, and they are actually not non-trivial points. They are not general points. They are something very non-trivial, and they are not local Nash equilibrium. So this kind of like, uh, what it's saying is a GDA might convert to some point that is a local, not, not local Nash equilibrium. And uh, many people kind of like in this field even started to design some algorithm which kind of like saying, okay, why not I just uh, like uh, manually el eliminate those kind of additional points. I just want to find local Nash by like looking at a second order algorithm or something like that. So what we are saying is, uh, okay, we don't quite believe local Nash is a right uh, notion we want to study. Why not like, look at local minimax and uh, how it related to stable limit points? It turns out we have a very nice characterization. So what we are saying is uh, we're doing this gradient descent ascent, and we have two learning rates, which is eta y and eta x. When, when the learning rate ratio goes to infinity, that means I, go to the ma I do the maximization much faster than doing the minimization. Then what I can prove, the stable limit point of my GDA are exactly local minimax point up to some degenerate points. Okay. So this is no longer one-sided relation. This is actually both-sided relation. So in short, what I'm saying is the stable limit point of infinite GDA is exactly to be the local minimax points. Uh, yes? Is, is it what? Gradient ascending in Y a lot and gradient descending in X, yes. But uh, I just want to know that this is, the, although we're, you're doing that, this scenario is completely different from the, from the previous scenario where we can solve the maximization efficiently. Because uh, in a non concave scenario, although you're doing a lot of on gradient ascent, you don't guarantee to find global max or anything. You can stuck in local max, you can stuck in some high order settle point or whatever it is. So. Oh, then you need to do gradient descent. You need to do gradient descent. If this is equal to zero, then this is not, it's not going to work. You need to be smaller, yeah, very, something very small. So this, um, in, our, in our paper, it's just, uh, this is going to infinity, but it's never going to be exactly infinity. So this picture kind of like summarizes the relation between these different sets. We know the local notch is actually the smallest set. We said it's inside the local min max. It's also inside the local max min. And there's a gamma GDA, which is a stable limit point of GDA. And the previous results kind of like saying local notch is inside this gamma GDA, but there are a lot of other non-trivial points, which is not local notch, which we cannot characterize by, by, like we don't know how to characterize it. And our paper is saying when making gamma larger and larger and larger, eventually it shifts to this set. When you go to infinite GDA, it's exactly the local min max points. Okay. 
So let me summarize the results I, I talk in this scenario. The first is about notion of local optimality. Previous work kind of like extensively studied the local notch equilibrium notion, and which is, uh, I would argue, is designed for simultaneous game. However, for the sequential games, now we have some new notion called local minimax point, which is uh, kind of like pretty well suited in this scenario. And we also study its relation to the stable limit points of GDA. Previous work kind of like saying notch equilibrium is a strictly subset of uh, the GDA stable points, which kind of like make in question what the other points of GDA converge into, and what we are saying is when we, when we do the, the learning ratio to be infinity, we kind of give the full characterization of stable limit point of GDA. Okay. So finally, I will just briefly mention some future directions. Uh, and the, the first one is about a non-convex concave setting. We kind of give the basic results. We kind of saying it's solvable efficiently. However, there's still a question about optimal rates. Can we do some acceleration on it? It's kind of like standard optimization problem. And the second one for the non-convex, non-concave scenario is kind of like much more challenging. And the first thing I, I would say is because uh, all we study is really just the stable limit point. We haven't touched the limit cycle issue yet. So can we understand what is the meaning of this limit cycle and when it's going to happen, when it's not going to happen, and how to break it? And finally, can we establish any convergence result in a general setting? Because uh, we have to break the limit cycle first, then we can say something about convergence in a general setting. Okay. I think this concludes my talk. And finally, I just want to acknowledge my wonderful collaborators, Tianling Yi, who is at Berkeley, and Prince Natural Party, who is at Microsoft uh, India, and my PhD advisor, Michael Jordan. Thank you. Your question? No. Okay. Yes, please. Yes, I, I said it's it's a it's something low local mean max. Uh, oh, sorry, it's a it's a low, low local means, and it's also convergence too. So, right, right. So uh, all my point is up to degenerate point. So I haven't characterized anything high order. So this is a basic second order. No, uh, I think so far it's, it's unclear yet. So I would argue for minimization, it's definitely a very good question. But for the minimax, I would say even a second order characterization is more or less like we just done recently. So, so high order is like more challenging questions. Yeah, and for the minimization, I, I don't think we kind of have characterized it. Yeah. 